In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
The Old Testament reading is found in Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but to roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Nothing that remains until... Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it. With your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your right hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The epistle is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. St. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you who are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the Lord. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. 
Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you shall have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, do not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but he is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. This is why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do just as I have done to you. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for the mercy and the grace you have poured out on us. We thank you that uh, we can hear your word. And though we be scattered, we might know that through this unity of the faith, we are still one in your Son, Jesus. We pray that you would open our ears to hear now, that we may grow with faith, in faith and in love. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the first Monday, Thursday, was filled with a lot of incongruities. It was filled with things that didn't completely match at all. On one hand, you had the joy of the night. They were celebrating the Passover, but at the same time, it was overlaid with betrayal. You had on one hand a burning desire for prestige amongst the apostles, and that was met with humble service. It was a night of gifts given to God's people. It was also a night of a new command. See, the story starts at dinner. And what is really remarkable when you hear that reading from John is how Jesus was filled with love. He had loved these men from the beginning to the end. And he loved them even at this moment. But there comes the problem, right? In the midst of his love, well, there the devil is planting evil into the heart of Judas. He laid in the heart of Judas that now was the time to betray Jesus. This night was going to betray Jesus. And so love was being met with betrayal. And at the same time, what do you see? But an argument brewing amongst the disciples. John doesn't talk about it, but St. Luke does in his gospel. John is, excuse me, the disciples are, are discussing who will be the greatest. This is a continuing debate amongst the disciples. They've had it probably three times by now. And they're going to debate again. Who's going to achieve? Who's going to be great? Who's going to be the brilliant one? Well, when the God, Jesus comes into his kingdom. Here they were on the night of a Passover. On a night that was there to remember God's mercy and compassion to, to his people. But what do they think about? Prestige and honor, glory, power. They miss the point, don't they? They miss the point of what God had done to redeem them from, from the Egyptians. They had missed how they had not done what was necessary, but yet God took them out, those who had faith in the blood of the Lamb. And they were concerned about nothing except themselves. And yet, here's Jesus filled with love. Here is Jesus still loving them to the end, knowing that though they were flawed and sinful people, these were his people. And so he does a most unusual thing. Jesus gets up from where he was eating, and he takes off his outer garment. So that all he has left is, is the inner garment on him. And he takes a towel, and it must have been a pretty large towel because he's able to wrap it around his body, tie it, and then he would begin to wash the feet of the disciples. You go from one disciple to the other and, and rinse their feet and take this towel that was wrapped around them and he'd reach out and begin to dry their feet with it. We hear no discussion amongst the disciples. They almost seem to be sitting in, in stunned silence in the midst of their worries about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus bows down before them to wash feet. One by one, he goes, and then he comes to Peter. He comes to Peter, and he says to Peter, or he goes to take Peter's feet, and, and Peter says, you're going to wash my feet, Lord? Not that he volunteers at all to wash Jesus' feet, does he? But he doesn't think it's proper for Jesus to wash his feet. And Jesus says, you have to let me, because if you don't, you'll have no part of me. And Peter, being Peter, wants his whole body washed at that point. 
And then Jesus says something kind of, kind of odd. He says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except his feet. He is completely clean. And all of a sudden we realize there's more going on here than just foot washing. And there's more happening here than just an example of love. Though foot washing is happening, obviously, and there's also the example of love that has been set up for God's people to follow. But what Jesus is reminding them is this. Even as my children, you collect filth. It might be the desire for power. It might be desire for acclaim. It might be the desires, well, of the flesh. It might be gorging yourself in food. But here is the issue. If you are my child, I wash away that outward grime, for you are clean already. See, Jesus seems to be talking about the forgiveness of sins. That when we belong to him, we still have the trouble of the, of the old sinful flesh and, and the fight and the battle against Satan within us. But yet we belong to him. And we come back to him even as we did tonight, as I stood before you and we confessed our sins together, as we stood together and we confessed and received the forgiveness. Jesus washed our feet. We are clean. For Jesus has acted as he has promised. And then Jesus explains what's going on. He says, you call me Lord and Master, and, and it's good that you do. But look at the way I've humbled myself. That's the way it ought to be. That we humble ourselves to serve one another. And from this flows the new command. Love one another even as I have loved you. See, Jesus is doing this on the night he's betrayed. He's doing it knowing his death is coming, where the, he would have the flow of blood and water from his side so that those people who are sitting there and to us to this day might find the forgiveness of sins. My death is coming, Jesus says. I have come to serve you. And now love as I have loved you. And how is Jesus loved? Well, I think the most remarkable thing is he is merciful. How many times when he heard the cry from the crowd, Lord, have mercy upon me, did Jesus turn and have mercy? He healed a blind man. He healed the lepers. He would even heal the Canaanite woman's daughter, even though she was an outsider. Jesus would heal those who lived by his mercy. And he poured it out time and time and time again. Even as he did to Peter and the disciples on the first Monday, Thursday. Even as they were arguing, Jesus had mercy on them. And instead of scolding them, he washed them their feet outwardly, and their hearts inwardly. But did you also receive the patience of Jesus? He had talked to the disciples before about this very same topic, but he didn't scold them. He loved them and lived as an example. You see, that's just the way Jesus is, isn't it? It's the way God is. He is not slow to come as we so often think, as we wait for a second coming. But he desires everyone to hear that word of God, and he desires all men to be saved. So he patiently waits as the word is spoken so that he can have mercy on people. Did you see the love of Jesus? He watched, it seems, almost for, to look for those who needed help. He seemed to watch out for those who were troubled and worried. But above all else, what we see in his patience and his mercy, what we see above all else is he deals with people who need help. So we see Jesus' forgiveness. 
we see that that mercy is played out not in pity, but in the forgiveness of the cross. The story that I always find so remarkable is when uh, Jesus had a crowd around the house in which he was staying, and people went up on a roof and lowered the paralytic down into the floor. Do you remember that story? And they were all looking at this man coming out of the ceiling and landing on the floor. And what does Jesus say to the man who's laying there paralyzed? He said, son, your sins are forgiven you. And then he healed him. But he went to the forgiveness of sins. Because that is what's needed. That is our greater need than any other great need we may have. And Jesus says to us, love as I have loved you. You know what that means? It means we learn to love God. We have repentant hearts. Not ones that simply voice the words that we have been taught to say and are a part of our liturgy. But we learn those words and take them to heart. For we are the ones who have fallen short of the glory of God. We are the ones who have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are not the ones who have loved God the way we ought when we have valued things more important as more important than the hearing the word of God. It means... When God says something, we take it to be for it to be what it is, the truth of God. And we bow before him with repentant hearts, knowing his forgiveness, his love, his patience, his mercy has come to us in Jesus Christ. You know what it means? It means we are obedient to his word. It means that we follow it. Oh, we may struggle at times, we may be imperfect, but it means we show love, for love is the fulfillment of the law. Even the new command is all love, isn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so we obey God's call and his command, and we love our neighbors. And it's not just that we talk about love, we love. And that might partly be, truthfully, the way we speak about one another the way we talk about pastors and teachers, the way we talk about neighbors, the way we talk about classmates and schoolmates. It's the way we show love, that we keep the Eighth Commandment, we defend their reputations and put the best construction and everything. But it actually may be that we get out and physically do something. That is the call of God for us. It might mean in this time of little illness that we rake our neighbor's yard for them because they can't get out. It might mean picking up groceries for the elderly neighbor or the young neighbor who's under quarantine. It might be sharing toilet paper with people who need our help. And yes, it might even, when the social distancing is finally over, perhaps it's even washing the feet of somebody we know who can't do their own. You see, love is concrete. It's action. It helps. Jesus' love was symbolized in washing the feet of another. Jesus' love was shown most clearly on that cross where Christ died for the forgiveness of our sins. There is love. And we learn that same love. And we forgive as we have been forgiven. There's a a church father by the name of Tertullian. He lived around the year 200 A.D. That's a long time ago. And at that time, he, he wrote that the non-believers who saw Christians would often say, see how they love one another because of the way they treated each other, and the way they talked of each other, and the way they helped each other. Oh, it's my prayer that the world would look at St. John and they would say the same thing. Oh, how they love one another. But there's only one way we ever learn to love. There's only one way we learn this sacrificial love. And it is to know Jesus. It is to know the depth of your sin. And even more, the deeper forgiveness that floods that sin and covers it and wipes it away and pushes it as far as the east is from the west. And though our sin be as scarlet, it becomes white as snow. For only then, when we meet Jesus, can we truly learn to love one another. 
Only then can we keep the commandment of Jesus. A new command I give to you. Love one another, even as I have loved you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. To God alone be all glory. Amen. Uh, this is the time that we, again, would normally collect our offerings. Um, we, first of all, thank those of you who have been remembering your congregation and, and through your offerings. Um, it still serves the Lord. Our teachers are busy teaching. Uh, though it's online, they have a lot of work they're doing. Your pastors are still busy trying to be pastors as best as possible. And uh, we still have light bills to pay. And so we thank you for remembering your church. We invite those who have not remembered us for a while, uh, especially our members, uh, to bring your tithes and offerings. Either uh, you can drop them off at church sometime, or you can go to the homepage of our church website, stjohnfraser.org, and there's a, a link to click on to figure out how to give electronically. We pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, especially in this day the doctors and nurses put in harm's way, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those of our congregation who are hospitalized, for those who are awaiting test results for COVID-19, for all those who are fearful for their family members, that they might find peace and comfort in this time of trial, that above all else, we might remember you that our Lord Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, ruling all things for the good of his people, the church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, in the wondrous sacrament which you have given to us, you left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that when we may again receive this together as a congregation, we might receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen.